All right, well, good evening, and uh, really appreciate you coming out uh, this evening. Sometimes that's tough on a, on a weekday night to get finished with whatever you've been doing during the day and maybe even get home first and then come to a meeting. So we really do appreciate your attendance. Uh, this is a public information meeting convened by DOE, and it is on the Waste Management Area C, a draft waste incidental to reprocessing evaluation and performance assessment. And you'll hear speakers and other people refer to this as the WEIR, so in case that is an unfamiliar acronym to you. So the purpose of the meeting is to provide some comprehensive information from DOE regarding the purpose, the scope, and the process for this um, waste management area C waste uh, we're reprocessing, reprocessing evaluation. It is a long name, so I'm going to do, do my best here. So this, this meeting really is about uh, getting information, being able to ask questions of DOE folks who are up here, and, and not just DOE folks, we'll be introducing the three presenters to you, and one is not with DOE. Um, but them being able to provide some information to you, and then you having an opportunity to ask questions of them. So I think there are, are some of you who are probably pretty interested in some opportunity to provide public comment, and that is not the meeting we're having tonight, but that has been, certainly that interest has been expressed um, to DOE, and I would say, and I think they would concur that if that continues to be an interest of yours, I would um, continue to uh, make that request. So I am Susan Heyman. Um, I'm a neutral third party uh, facilitator. Um, I work for a company called Enviro Issues, uh, so I'm not affiliated with the agencies. And my role really here tonight is um, first to just try to keep things on time and on track. Uh, secondly, to try to provide as much opportunity for people to ask questions as possible. And, and in the doing of that, um, I'm going to be leaning a little bit towards people who haven't had a chance to ask a question before and who may be at one of these meetings for the first time. So that is in no way um, discriminating against those of you who have uh, had the fortitude to attend numerous meetings like this, but I'm just going to really be looking for people uh, who haven't maybe had that opportunity and, and I give them a shot tonight as well. Uh, let's see, so um, the way it's going to work and the way your agenda reads is we'll have three presentations. The first two deal with agency process and agency review. And the third presentation is, is a little more technical and it's going to focus on um, the tanks and the tank retrieval and the tank inventories. After each of those presentations, we'll have a brief period for some clarifying questions and the presenters uh, our practice and, and are certainly aware that uh, they want to try to keep those presentations as succinct as possible so that we can get to your questions. We'll get through those three presentations and then we'll bring those three presenters up in a panel format and then we'll spend the rest of the evening in Q&A. Uh, &A. And one thing I realized at the meeting we had in Portland on Tuesday is um, I was just blissfully doing my facilitator thing and then somebody pointed out to me, well, how do you get like how do you get in the queue? How do you get you know a question answered? So I had forgot to mention, and when we get to that point, if you just raise your hand, I'll jot you down, and if I don't know your name, I'll jot down something you're wearing, and I'll come back to you. So, and that way you don't have to keep your hands raised and, and be uncomfortable that way. Um, because you won't be able to ask your questions maybe the minute they come to your head, I would suggest if you have a pen and some paper, uh, just keeping track of those questions so that you don't lose them, because I know that can be frustrating. Um, if you are making comments or rhetorical kinds of questions, those will not be addressed tonight. And again, if when you're asking questions, if it appears that you're giving more of a comment, I'll I'll probably intervene at some point and ask you if you could please get to your question. So a suggestion there is just lead with the question that you have, and then if you have some context to put around it, then put it around that at that point. It helps the presenters also, or the speakers, panelists, to know what your actual question is. And similarly, I'm asking the presenters and the, the panelists that when they're answering your question, to lead with the answer so that you get an answer quickly, and then if they need to put more context around it, they can do that as well. 
So we are going to be using a microphone tonight. Um, we have some media here, and they're plugged into the sound system. I think it just makes it easier for everybody to hear, and certainly for me, uh, my voice is at a point where if without the microphone, you might not be able to hear me. So the presenters will use microphones here and here. When we get to the Q&A, we have someone that's going to be running a mic to you, and they'll actually hold the microphone for you, and then I'll point them around to where we go, and we'll try our very best to not make that be a cumbersome process. I uh, just want to remind you or let you know that DOE isn't recording this meeting and there's not a formal summary of it, but certainly the questions that you're asking are being noted and, and I think um, are very helpful to DOE uh, to understand what it is that people are unclear about and how they might be able to help clarify that later. Um, today's meeting presentations and the handouts from the agency are going to be available on the WEIR website. There's a poster back here in the corner that has the website information. It also has how you can submit comments and things. So uh, please, if you haven't made yourself aware of that website, uh, grab that um, link so that you'll be able to do that. Uh, there are uh, uh, written comment forms. They look like this. They are available in the back of the room. So while verbal comment isn't being taken tonight, um, DOE certainly welcomes your written comments. Uh, so if you want to leave them tonight, you can. And you don't even have to use this form. So it's, it's here for you, but uh, don't feel compelled to use it. There's a box back there that says comments. So please, please feel free to put it in there if that's the case. I think the last thing I need to note um, I just want to ask for your help tonight on meeting conduct. So that's really the third role of what people like me do. So we keep things on track. We try to give people opportunity. And then I want to make sure that I can help maintain an atmosphere where everybody feels comfortable here. So to that extent, I'm going to ask for your help in just engaging in very civil conduct. Um, let's be respectful to each other. Uh, would expect the same thing of the presenters to be respectful as they're answering you, much in the way you ask them uh, questions in a civil way and and, uh, and, and and just respectfully as you can. There's no problem with disagreeing. There's no problem with disagreeing stridently. But let's just uh, try to keep this as a nice civil meeting because we see lots of examples of where that isn't the case. And let's not do that tonight. The meeting is intended to be information sharing. So let's have a good dialogue. And I think with that, I'm ready to turn it over to Sherry Ross. Oh, I didn't actually introduce our three speakers. Sherry Ross will be our first speaker. She's DOE Environmental Management, so US Department Department of Energy um, Environmental Management Headquarters Office. She'll be followed by Chris McKinney, who's with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and Chris Kemp, who is with US DOE Office of River Protection. So with that, Sherry, I'll turn it over to you, and I'll adjust the lights. Thank you. Can y'all hear me? Excellent. Well, thanks for having me here. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, um, I was born, raised, and educated in South Carolina, so this is a true Southern draw. Um, I went to Clemson University, got a degree in chemical engineering, and went to work for the Department of Defense um, at Charleston Naval Shipyard, doing nuclear waste um, activities. Um, Hurricane Hugo ran me out of Charleston, ended up in Aiken, South Carolina, with the Department of Energy, and have been doing waste management activities ever since. Um, Low-level waste, transuranic waste, mixed waste, um, high-level waste. Went into high-level waste in the early 2000s. Um, I do have 30 years, more than 30 years experience um, with the federal government and have spent quite a bit of time on high-level waste activities in treatment, processing, characteristics, hazard analysis. I took a job with headquarters um, in Washington area. I actually live in Maryland uh, over a year and a half ago. Um, my responsibilities are WEIR activities, which we're talking about now. I also am the, one of the co-chairs for the D Department of Energy's low-level um, waste, uh, low-level disposal facilities federal review group. We are DOE is a self-regulator for our radioactive materials, and it's part of our regulatory role. So I do work in the Office of Regulatory Compliance for the Department of Energy, and do uh, low-level waste activities across the DOE complex. So just a little bit of background about myself. Today I'm going to talk about the big picture. I want to give you the 
why are we here? What is a weird determination? Um, has DOE made other determinations? What's the regulatory process for closing a tank? And how the, um, these weird determinations are made? What's the process, you know, the decision process within the department? What's the criteria that has to be met before that decision's made? What is a performance assessment? And then how to submit comments? A lot of words on the slide. So, a waste incidental to reprocessing, commonly referred to as a weir, um, a determination. It's a decision that the waste is appropriate, it's safe, um, environmental safe, uh, uh, protective of human health, um, for management as non hallable waste. This process um, is not addressing the contaminated soils or groundwater. Those are subsequent decisions that will be made by the department, um, not just by the department, by other regulatory agencies as well. <laughs> Um, it is to address the operating system, okay, the permitted system. It's the tanks, the ancillary equipment and structures, the pipelines, and any contamination that resides that remains in that system after we have retrieved the waste and cleaned it to the extent we think is possible. So, I, you know, residuals are what's left in the tank after cleaning. Stabilization is referred to. We, we do plan to fill the, the tanks with grout. So it's a solid, stable waste form that's left. And uh, that's really what a weird determination is. It's a decision. The, the evaluation document, the draft evaluation document that's been published um, is presents for that system and its proposed closure, how it's meeting the criteria that's required to be met before we can decide this is not high level waste. So the answer is yes, the department has made other determinations, quite a number of them. Um, we, there was a Determination made for Savannah Riverside for the decontaminated salt solution that after treatment it's non hallable waste. That was done in January of 2006. Also in 2006, a determination was made to close some tanks at Idaho, um, the National um, Laboratory there. Closure for F Tank Farm at Savannah Riverside, followed by closure of um, H Tank Farm. Um, and also at West Valley in New York, um, there were some uh, weird determinations made for the feed, uh, the concentrated uh, feed makeup tank and a melter feed hole tank. Okay, this slide's really busy. We do have a poster on this slide. Um, let me point out a couple of things. Um, first, this is a draft. This is trying to depict in the flow chart the decisions that are required to actually close a tank, implement closure actions. It's arranged in, in what we call swim lanes. Uh, this is the operating system. This is soils and groundwater. So we are here to talk about the, the waste incident reprocessing evaluation, and that is really the scope of the comments that we are asking. When we make this determination, um, and we will not make this determination until after the Department of Energy consults with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and we receive public comments and comments from the state regulators, the Indian nations, uh, those will all be factored into, into DOE's decision that's made. Um, this process is very onerous. There's a lot of decisions to be made. When we make this decision, it is not going to authorize closure of the tank. There are quite a number of activities that have to happen before we can actually close a tank. For one, the, the waste that's in the tanks is also hazardous, so it requires a permit from the Washington State of Ecology. Um, so the RECRA activities have to happen. Um, and of course, there are soils that we know are contaminated. We have to make decisions on those. So there will be record decisions on those. We'll also work with EPA uh, on the groundwater and any radio radio radioactive material that's also left there in the soil and the groundwater. <clears throat> the underpinning the decisions 
our performance assessment, there's four volumes, and there's another graph in this presentation to talk about those that performance assessment. The first one um, on the operating system, there's two portions. There's the radionuclides and the hazardous constituents. So this document here with the draft weir is has been made available. It's on the website. It is the entire scope of this decision because this decision is related to the radioactive material that's in the operating system. <clears throat> We do have an analysis of soils. We have, um, I mean, of the hazardous constituents in the operating system and also for the soils and what's in the um, groundwater and the uh, contaminants from past leaks. All four of these documents, all four um, volumes of this performance assessment has been prepared by the Department of Energy and is under the three of, these three are under state review and we're resolving comments. We will make these documents public and available for review to support these other decisions. The stars on this chart indicate when the public activities are going to happen. So there's other, there's going to be other public activities um, where you can submit comments before final decisions are made. So the process. Um, the performance assessment, the radiological, that volume one of the performance assessment, un it provides the information that's also summarized in the draft weir evaluation, and it's undergoing a public review as well as a review by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, we'll receive those public comments. We share those public comments with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and NRC will actually provide us a technical evaluation report. And the Department of Energy is going to consider all public comments and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's independent technical evaluation to finalize this draft weir evaluation. And then, then management will make a decision on whether we're gonna determine this waste is appropriate to be managed as non-high level waste. We expect this to take about a year. We started in June. It'll be sometime next year. I've got a schedule on the next slide. And we have extended the public comment period through November the 7th. So more detail on the NRC review process. NRC is looking at our technical evaluation document, the performance assessment, and any underlying reference document. Um, they will provide to the Department of Energy a request for additional information that will be in writing. And when we receive that, we plan to hold a public meeting. So the green activities on this chart are public. And we'll have that meeting, we think, in December, it may be January, um, to ask clarifying questions, to make sure that Department of Energy understands what NRC is asking for. Then we will go off and likely remodel, answer their technical questions, provide that back to NRC, and we'll have another meeting where NRC will get to ask DOE, um, where DOE will present the information that we provided to NRC. NRC will then issue the review report and we expect that around June, it may be a little bit longer, depending on the scope of the technical questions they're asking, and we will consider that before making a decision. We're not expecting that decision until sometime next fall, probably maybe September, it could be longer. Um, so these dates are, are, are estimates, they're subject to change. Um, we do have public meetings are intended for DOE and NRC um, discussions because that is the scope of these meetings. Um, the public is invited to observe um, and if, if we have time available to make comments. Um, DOE and NRC, we are having um, public conference calls to ask clarifying questions and the public's invited to listen in on those. That information is posted on the website and I'm going to show it to you on a slide up, up here. Um, and in those, you're more than welcome to make a statement as long as there's time. But again, the information, uh, the purpose of the meeting is for DOE and NRC to exchange information. We just, you're welcome, the public's welcome to listen in on that if they, if they, if you want to. Criteria. So there's three criteria that has to be met in order to make this determination. Um, the material should be processed and will be processed to remove the key radionuclides to the maximum extent that is technically and economically practical. 
They will be managed to meet their safety requirements comparable to the performance objectives set out in 10 CFR 61. 10 CFR 61 is an NRC guide, which is one of the reasons we're consulting with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And they're to be managed pursuant to our authority, DOE's authority, under the Atomic Energy Act, provided the waste is incorporated into a solid physical form. Okay, we won't leave liquids in the tanks. Um, in a concentration that does not exceed the concentration limits for Class C low-level waste is set out in 10 CFR 61.55. So the um, WEIR evaluation is set up. There's a chapter on each of these three criteria. So if, if you're interested in how we remove waste, um, you just go to that chapter, and it's all laid out there. We explain all that. So I mentioned a performance assessment. It sort of underpins um, the, the document. It's one of the major references in the document. Let me explain what a performance assessment actually is. It's really a risk analysis. We're trying to um, understand how the closed system is going to um, perform long term. Um, how are the contaminants, how might they leave the system, interact with the environment, and interact with humans? We're not trying to predict doses, but based on assumptions, we model the performance of the facility. And so we can determine what the likely risk could be um, related to the decision that's being made. So it's a pro process to demonstrate confidence that the doses are given um, will be less than the standard that has been determined to be protective of human health and the environment. It's a learning process. Uh, it's an iterative process. So when you run the model, when you find out information, you can change your parameters, run it again. You want to run multiple cases. And this provides information. The performance assessment itself is not a decision document. It provides information to the decision makers before they make decisions. It also helps to identify monitoring requirements. Uh, if we were going to pull groundwater samples just to confirm and verify that the contaminants are not moving, where might you want to put your, your monitoring wells so that you can see those contaminants if they were to migrate? Um, maintenance needs. Um, since the performance assessment is predicting long term, um, we, the Department of Energy runs its models um, to peaks. So um, our, our uh, compliance period is 1,000 years. That's a long time to predict. We're looking at 10,000-year windows. We also look beyond because we want to know what's important to the performance. Is it, is it the grout we're putting in the tank? Um, is it the closure cap over it? There's different barriers and how will those barriers perform and might perform in different ways um, and what might the resulting doses be? So we do learn a lot from the performance assessment. And I mentioned maintenance before, so integrating the modeling, monitoring, and model support. The performance assessment is a living document. We're required to do maintenance activities, do R&D, um, test your soil. How do contaminants actually migrate through that soil? What's the appropriate KD value? So we develop maintenance and monitoring, and, and we learn things every, every year as we go, and we revalidate, is your PA still accurate? Is it still representative of how the system is performing? And if we need to modify that PA, we do. We can add special analysis to add information to that performance assessment, or we can revise the performance assessment when new information becomes available. So I mentioned before the performance assessment is really a four volume set. So the first volume, the first two volumes is the operating system. It is limited to the tanks, the ancillary equipment, and the pipelines and the contaminants within. So the first one, of course, is listed is just the radionuclides, the radioactivity that's in the system. We also evaluated the hazardous constituents in the record closure analysis, volume two. Volume three is a baseline risk assessment. We're looking at the contaminants in the soil um, and past leaks and how they might have migrated. And the whole system has been developed. All four volumes have been developed. We've published the, the first volume, and it's part of this decision. Um, the other three volumes will become available um, after working with the state of Washington and to support other decisions. Here's a, um, 
a, a picture of the actual website that DOE has posted and the information that's available on that website. Um, and we have some of the posters here is the information that's actually available on that website. So um, you can look at the timeline and see what have we done and wh what's happening next. And if you want to listen in on a conference call between DOE and NRC, you, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, we've posted the presentations. Um, you can find the WEIR here, the, the actual evaluation document. And um, when we do, when DOE and NRC have um, conference calls, we do develop a summary of that conference call and post it for public review as well. So if you missed one, you can just go look at the summaries and understand what information we're discussing. How to submit comments. Um, comments should be submitted either by email or by mail to these locations. We do want them in writing. We don't want to misinterpret your comments. Um, and we, we prefer they come by November the 7th. And I think I'm ahead of schedule. We want to leave plenty of time for questions. Wow. So hit me up. I'm super impressed. You said leave more time for questions. Good job. <laughs> All right, so I see Tom's hand up. Let me just ask if there's anyone that is a first timer that has a question for Sherry. Tom, oh, uh, I'll come to you next. Go ahead, Tom, ask your question and then next. Uh, okay, so you, because uh, it's not quite clear, the waste in the tank right now, you've been treating that as high level waste, right? We have been managing that waste as high level waste, that is correct. Okay, so now it will become. characterization, the classification of it from high level waste to low level waste with putting cement or grout into the ground. Why are those two decisions together as opposed to separate decisions? Um, the I have a follow up question. To meet the criteria. Let me just ask real quick can you hear Tom because we didn't get a mic to him, but we'll get mics to other people? Run a mic over there just real quick. Just want to be sure everybody can hear it. I've got you in the queue. So, Tom, also, um, the decision, the determination. If the department decides, and we're not, we haven't made that determination yet, but if we decide it's appropriate to be managed as low-level waste, it's based on these specific criteria. And the, the waste needs to be in a stable form. Um, we would not, and typically that decision's made at, on the final waste form. You classify your waste at disposal. Um, we may manage the waste as high-level waste, but when you go to make its final disposition, it needs to be based on the characteristics of your final waste. Um, you may treat the waste, um, change its form, change its radiological characteristics, um, and you want your decision on your final disposition to be based on its final waste form. Okay, and okay. last one. And, then okay. Okay. and the, the last one was about just how confident, uh, how many uh, samples you've taken from each tank to get to the a confidence on how much radioactive constituent is there. Yes, yeah, so every tank has and characterize. And Chris, actually, you're going to cover some of that in your presentation, aren't you? Yeah. So I'm, if you'll hold that question for Chris, he knows a lot more details about the specifics. But every tank, after cleaning, um, multiple samples were pulled to, pull, to identify a representative characterization of the material that remains in those tanks. Hmm? OK, so we're going to go to this woman here. And Robin's going to bring the mic. I'm going to ask her to hang on to the mic. So don't touch your mic. I'll keep talking. <laughs> I know that girl. So I actually have two questions. Um, one in follow-up to the question about adding something to high-level waste and now it's no longer high-level waste. Um, like, I don't know much about this, but the Russians tried that at Chernobyl and they thought cement worked 
and it didn't work after a period of time. So with radioactivity that lasts for 10,000 years, how can you be sure that whatever you're mixing with high level waste is today low level, but 100 years from now it's not anymore? So that's one question. Should we, we let her answer that one? Or? Sure. So if you look at criteria number one, um, to remove the rain nuclides to the maximum extent practical. So these tanks, although the waste in the tanks were managed as high level waste, we've taken 96% out. And so we're really looking at the characteristics of the residuals that are left. And, it's, and if we were to stabilize them in that form, and that is what the basis of this evaluation does. And so we're providing that information for you to, to comment on um, before the department makes a decision. Well, I guess my concern is that it's um, this idea that it's going to get stabilized just because it's a criteria that was written, I don't know when, 1970, 1980. Things change and we learn more information. So what about my grandkids? You know, they're going to be potentially exposed to something that you thought met a criteria in 2018, but in 2020, it's not going to work anymore. Yeah. So that's what, that's my concern. I think Understand. to always say, oh, well, it's following the criteria is a yeah. little bit disingenuous. Okay. The second to, thing I, do. I have. I, I think I, we're, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to you. I'd like to get to some other folks. Well, I'd like to add to, uh, some response because that's a very good question. So your, your concern is, it, let me paraphrase my understanding, um, is long term. What if we're wrong? We've, we've characterized it and we've evaluated and we think it's a safe option. So we do have, I mentioned monitoring and maintenance activities. We will monitor the groundwater to ensure, along with the state regulatory agencies, and we will publish reports. And if we find out we're wrong, we can take additional actions because the department is committed to meeting these performance objectives and providing safety to the public um, and the environment and to our workers. And so we can monitor and issue reports and we can change our closure cap we can go in and address the soil so this decision for the system is not impacting that decision for the soils those are subsequent decisions that need to be made but I do hear you so we do have maintenance and monitoring the record we talked about other permits that are going to be required before we close these tanks typically those are specified in that and that's also a public process before we make that decision you may have more questions. So <laughs> okay, um, Madam, in the same row, I think Robin, if you could hustle over there, this because uh, Robin made her steps here today. Right. I'll show it. Yeah, if you can stand up. Um, I was just wondering, since the DOE tried to rename the high-level waste in 2004, it was stopped by uh, high-level congressional action, how, do, how does the DOE uh, seriously justify trying this new scheme again, knowing how serious the situation is? And um, really, the public is actually rather informed, so I'm just wondering what is really the justification for this? That's a great question. So um, there's a slide that's, is it in the backup? I'm uh, not sure what slide you're looking for. So they used to have a slide. Here it is. It's in backup. So there's two methods to make, and you're, you are absolutely correct, and the department's very familiar with that. So when that lawsuit hit and it was determined not to be ripe, it was upheld by a court, but then it was determined not to be ripe for, for lawsuit, Congress wrote a new law called Section 3116, it's a long name, the Ronald um, W. Reagan National Defense Authorization Act, and we call it the NDAA for 2005, um, that allows the department to make this determination. Um, and that, that only applies to South Carolina and Idaho. So under the order, there's very similar criteria um, that applies to the other sites. We have made determinations in the state of New York under DOE order, um, and this draft we're 
for waste management area C is, is following that same criteria. There's an appendix A and B in the WEIR evaluation that does a comparison between 3116 and the order 435.1, and the department is following the same process. We are consulting with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and although not required, we are doing this public process because we want public comments. We want to understand what your concerns are. So, you know, we have made other decisions. We're not doing anything different here at Hanford than we have done at other sites. It's a good question. Did you have a follow up? Any follow up question? No. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so I have this gentleman <laughs> in the front, right, right here, third row. And then across from him, the next question will be Shannon in that round. And then right here. Okay. Yeah, here. I'm going to try to get about okay. six in the queue for you. <laughs> there and then. I have a question about the residual uh, mm -hmm. in the tanks because it's it's the sludge from uh, wastes that are contaminated with uh, radioactive heavy elements. It would seem to me that the highest concentrations of the nastiest things are going to be in the sludge at the bottom of the tank, which you're proposing to leave. <laughs> Yes, well, the department has removed about 96%, over 96% of the waste that's in the tank. And it's not really about the volume, it's about the hazards. So what's left is the, the radioactivity and the hazardous constituents and the risk that it poses. Um, of the residual that's left, um, the bulk of that, over 90%, are radioisotopes that have less than 30-year uh, half-lives. So typically, if you may, you know, radioactivity decays on based on its half-life. And um, so if we can isolate it for 300 years, that gets 10 half-lives of that 90-something percent of the re residual radioactivity. There are long-lived isotopes. We've evaluated that. Predominantly, TEC-99 and iodine are the two that we're concerned with, and we will monitor for those. We can remediate um, those activities if, if it starts migrating. So what well, we can. Um, and we will monitor that. Two points taken, but. Do you have a follow up, sir? No. Nope. Okay, right, nope, right, turn around right there. Um, my question's about the performance assessment and the baseline risk assessment. Um, I'm curious, can you clarify what the future land use you've selected and also how many years out the model goes? Uh, we've ran the model. Um, all the results are to 10,000 years are presented in the evaluation document. Um, we've run it longer than that. Um, I can't remember. It was like 600,000 years. Is that right? It was, we, we have to run the model to the peak of each of those regular new lives that are left in the tank. So we ran it out. Can you repeat that? The showed up. So that was Yeah. What's the future land use uh, We only take credit for 100 years, although the department does not intend on releasing the entire site. Um, we only take institutional controls for 100 years in the analysis. So, okay. I, well, sorry, to clarify, I mean, are you imagining like a farmer living there? Oh, yes, yes, or? yes. And um, I might have some backup slides. Here's one. So yes, we do assume we lose institutional control and someone lives on top of it, okay. drills down and gets the groundwater, uses that groundwater for, uh, actually uses the drill cuttings, spreads them out, grows a garden, eats out of the garden, drinks the groundwater, use, you know, waters their livestock, and, and we look at that, what that potential dose could be. So yeah, and that happens at, after 100 years. Okay. Good question. Okay, just right here, and then we're going to go to the back. And so you said in the future the soil would be monitored to make sure that nothing was leaching? Um, and so if you do find out that levels are high and you need to, I assume, remove it in the future, is it possible with now that it's cemented? Is it possible in the future to remove it once you've done this? Yes, you can take actions in the soil and to protect the groundwater. 
um, we, we likely would not dig up the, you know, the, the tank in the, um, the grout. But if it is migrating from the tank, so here's a good graph. So the red would be the predominantly where the contamination is located. You have grout. You've got three barriers here, um, but we would be monitoring the groundwater and, and seeing how it's moving. And if there is concern, um, we would want to first of all figure out why our model is not right. But you can take other actions. We could improve um, the closure cap. That's on top. Um, if more infiltration of rainwater is actually moving the contaminants differently. Um, and that will be work out with the state regulators. But we, we do monitor and we can take additional actions. I mean, Savannah Rivers, for instance, iodine can be um, remediated with silver chloride to form a silver iodine bond to prevent it from migrating further. So there are, there are ways to, depending on what your concern is, to address that. Can I follow up? And if there, are there, is it factored in, and this may not even make sense, excuse this question, but if there was like a sinkhole or an earthquake, like what would, is that? Yes, very good question. So we are predicting long term, tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years we, we run our model. Um, so we look at what we call features, events, and processes that may act on this, such as earthquakes, uh, change in um, uh, rainwater, um, so all those things are factored in, and how might that affect the performance of the facility? For instance, an earthquake may crack that grout, so rainwater may get in and flush out the contaminants earlier than we thought, earlier than the baseline assessment may assume. We run those activities and, and models and, and have looked at the results for all cases. Um, so, but, but take a look at it. If you think we should have done some, a different analysis, please give us that comment. We can, we can take a look at it. Okay, so I'm going to take two more comments before we go to the next presentation, but remember that there's going to be additional comment time at the end. So we'll get this gentleman and then up here in the front. Hello, my name is Richard Ellison. Uh, I've actually visited Hanford in the 1980s with uh, uh, Congressman Bonker's um, uh, crew. I'm uh, very concerned about this wishful thinking of, well, we've done these studies and everything's going to be fine. Um, the, the history of Hanford is one of wishful thinking. The, the single, uh, uh, single layer uh, steel t storage tanks were supposed to last for a minimum of 500 years. Um, they started leaking shortly uh, after, within decades of there being construction. They were supposed to have been emptied out decades ago. They're still not emptied out now. You're having a lot of problems getting all everything out of the tanks. And so it's your solution is to basically abandon them because you can't get them out. I think the, the term, the, the question, well, I'll have, you claim that unless it's technically or economically practical, you're not going to do anything. And really, this is the most expensive public works project ever, so none of it is really technically or economically practical. So really, it's a decision-making process that is thwart with impracticalities. Um, how can... Here's my question for you. If, if, if migration occurs, mm -hmm. and I suspect most likely it's going to be from the groundwater coming up from underneath or a lateral movement of water from underneath, um, how is it possible that you're going to have a remedy that's going to be economically and technically practical to solve this migration problem of the radionucleotides? Okay, well, the, the decisions related to the soil and soil migration are not the subject of this, of this decision. Um, there will be analysis provided to the public and decisions made by multiple agencies, including the Department of Energy and the state of Washington and likely the Environmental Protection Agency um, to address those concerns. So, my follow-up question is... Just follow-up, please make it short, because I how is it that you can separate these two actions of, of filling it with grout and calling it done from that phase of it before you have a practical solution in case there are other problems like it leaking underneath? How can you delay that decision and say, well, we're going to do part one's okay now, we'll worry about part two another time. Don't worry, trust us. What, what's the practical solution to this? Okay, so this decision is just determining it's, it's safe 
to manage is low-level waste. It is not the actual decision to close the tank. Additional information, including a composite analysis, will be done to support that decision. So if I go back, just to, just to point out one more time, I didn't really talk about this. I apologize. At the top, there is a composite analysis that's going to look at all source terms that interact with that um, tank system if, if we were to grout it. There is a composite ana analysis available now, vintage about 2000. We are updating that. The updated analysis will be used to make the closure decision, the closure authorization, and these other activities also have to be made. So at this time, and that's open for public comment, it's just the determination as to if it is it safe to manage as low-level waste. It's not the determination or the decision to actually close and grout the tank. Okay, so last question just for this section. And, uh, so um, managing as low-level waste, you said there were, uh, currently there are still some long-lasting isotopes in there. So what are the consequences then if the tanks leak and the radioactive iodine, say, is leached into, into the land and into the groundwater there. Are there not currently people who are utilizing resources around the Hanford site that might be impacted? What's the human health effect to that? Um, because in my mind, that would inevitably weigh or should weigh into your decision on whether or not it's safe to classify these isotopes long lasting hundreds of thousands of years as low level waste when mm -hmm. they're going to be around for years yeah that's a great question we have analyzed its its migration the quantity that's there and the potential impacts we do have and chris will probably talk about this more in his presentation um we do have some iodine from historical um, activities at the site what's in the groundwater that groundwater is not being used for drinking water at this time, and those decisions related to the soil and cleanup of the groundwater will be made. It's, it's under a different process, as described on this graph. Sure. You look puzzled. More to come. But do you have a quick follow-up question at this point? Ask Chris. <laughs> Well, I would just think that I know that there are certain communities, perhaps tribal communities in the area that utilize resources around there. And I would wonder if they're currently being impacted or could be in the future. Yeah, no, no, not at this point. We do not have plumes that are migrating off the site and no one's drinking that water. And we will monitor the departments required by our regulations and the state of Washington is going to force us to monitor and report on those activities. There are annual environmental reports that are available now that you can look at. Um, we are not impacting the human health uh, of, of the public at this time. All right. Thank you for your questions. I'll hold those other ones that you have for Sherry because she'll be Chris. excited to get to those soon. Um, so I think you're off the hook, and I'm going to uh, ask Chris McKinney to come up. I'm going to zip through to get to his slides. All right, Chris, you're ready to go. Evening. Um, my name is Chris McKinney. I am the branch chief at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission over the technical staff that is reviewing um, waste determinations for the Department of Energy. NRC does not have a regulatory role, nor uh, any oversight by law of the Hanford site, but DOE has brought us in to do an analysis mu very much similar to the role we play at Idaho and South Carolina uh, under the legislation for those states. Um, I'm going to skip ahead since uh, Sherry put already what is weird a little bit. So currently we've been asked to review the draft, weird, uh, draft waste uh, determination for waste management area C. Uh, this is done through an interagency agreement um, as it's a role that DOE has asked us to do and it's not part of our uh, requirements. NRC does not have a monitoring role at Hanford, so we will be making recommendations on the waste termination, but we will not have a role after that fact. So DOE has submitted their evaluation to us for our review. Uh, as Sherry said, it will take about a year. But prior to even shipping that 
providing that to us, we had uh, we were part of several years of scoping meetings and technical exchanges with the Department of Energy, uh, along with several other stakeholders, including the tribes and the Department of Ecology, on what should go in, on what should be evaluated, what processes, earthquakes, uh, rainfall changes the cover being destroyed by a flood, all those sort of assumptions that need to be at least evaluated and made to uh, look at what could happen in the future. We are currently under detailed technical review now of the waste determination, the supporting risk assessment or the performance assessment is, and all of the documents that support the performance assessment because each each ology has its own basic document, whether it's geology, hydrology, every one of them has a ton of information that they've used to try to support their models and assumptions. We will then, after getting responses from DOE on our additional information we request, uh, develop our technical evaluation report with our recommendations to the um, DOE. Uh, I have a team of basically three people, although um, the two project managers, mostly Lloyd is my Lloyd is doing my uh, lead for my um, review, um, and then my two technical staff of Hans and Dave are doing the the detailed technical analysis, building independent models, and doing a lot of reviewing of their documents. Uh, the reason we're involved is there are three similar criteria and that while we have authorization at Savannah Riverside and, I, and at Idaho, um, we uh, are also involved at West Valley um, and then Hanford uses the DOE order um, manual 435.1 or order 435.1. And they all have similar cr criteria of trying to remove, if you're going to leave something in the near surface, you need to remove all the key, as much of the key radio nuclides as you can, and also be able to manage this low level waste. In other words, meet all the safety criteria if you were building a low level waste site or something else in the near surface um, at the place. When on Sherry's slide, she said, she had a thing about the performance objectives of part 61. Oh, nice gobbledygook there for everybody. Um, 10 CFR part 61 is the regulation at NRC that governs the safe disposal of low level waste. And it has four, four main performance objectives. Or, and the first is the protection of the general population. This is the long term protection at 100 meters from the site. This isn't at seven miles at the river. This is doing an analysis at 100 meters from the site, assuming somebody uses the groundwater there or uses the plants on the surface. It gets air dose from that or anything else. The second criteria is protection of, of uh, in individuals from inadvertent intrusion. This is assuming someone actually digs into the waste. Like Sherry said, drills right through a tank, brings take cuttings up, and you're exposed directly to the waste rather than it having to migrate through to groundwater. The third one is protective individuals during operations. Um, with this tank farm being nearly closed, that's a lot less than some of the other analyses where they've still been managing tanks um, and actually doing bulk removal still. And the fourth is really important, of course, for all of these, all of these other ones. Your cover's not going to work great if your site subsides. If you're, you know, what is the earthquake potential to damage your site? Um, w will groundwater come up high enough to actually go into where the waste is? Not as much of an issue maybe at Hanford for coming up, but at, out at Savannah River site, that's much more of a question. We review. We try to review all the documents. Um, we're talking tens of thousands of pages here. Um, but we have done our completeness review. We are, we start with the waste determination, see where they've used their analyses to support their findings, then start doing what documents, what are the important factors in that? 
What is driving the analysis? What are the what ifs they've done? What are the uncertainty involved in various features and events? How have they looked at that uncertainty? How have they managed it? And with that, we then go to lower and lower documents in the tiers to um, develop that. We also sometimes develop independent models to say, okay, we're not sure how they, we're not sure if they did it, they did it this way. Let's look at it from a different point of view. Would we get a different answer if we looked at it from a different point of view? Um, so, you know, you get cartoon graphics of exposure scenarios like in the upper right of the resident gardener, resident farmer scenario where people are getting it from the ground, groundwater and getting potentially air dose from the site, doing all the things that they could do from, from farming to crops, which are built into computer models that don't look as great because they're just like little boxes and stuff. Um, but it, it really is what is, we have to look at what can happen, how likely is that to happen, including the uncertainties, and what can result. And that is, you know, that's the risk triplet. That is uh, how you assess risk is saying, is looking at that. But you have to look at it from multiple dimensions. Everybody will build, hey, I built this one model. Well, is that the right model? And we have to look at the uncertainty and just selection of model, not just um, the selection of how much rainfall is there. Um, we have a guidance document, um, as like every government agency, um, that we uh, built that's specifically for waste determinations. And um, so it's New Reg 1854. It's on, our, on the NRC's webpage under Waste Incidental Reprocessing is a site that has all of our documents on it. Um, we try to be very open and transparent with all our dealings, whether it's with the Department of Energy in this case or with our normal licensees. Um, for this, all of our documents are publicly available. Our request for additional information will be public. As Sherry said, we're going to have public meetings before and after the um, um, uh, request for additional information, and we're currently providing public summaries of the telephone calls we have with DOE right now. We are uh, then going to develop the technical evaluation report, and it's when we send it to DOE, it will be public. Um, on there is this project number on the bottom. If you know how to use our Atom system, um, our informational system, which is called Atoms, uh, that right after Proj P R O J, that's a zero for zero seven three six, not O seven three six. And if you do that, you'll see all the documents. We have uh, other considerations. We are, there were multiple criteria um, because of the state of the tanks uh, and previous discussions NRC has had on specific tanks in the past um, due to previous consultations we've had over the years. DOE has requested us to, to look at the performance objectives. What is the risk? What, is, what could happen? Would, these, would, the, would it stay in this state if that was approved in a future decision on closure? Would that still be safe? Um, over spending a lot of our effort looking at exactly how much removal, what, what would be an alternate technology they could use. The, um, we all, they also told us exactly what we used to evaluate for consistent with the DOE order rather than NRC approaches. Um, so I think this one's pretty clear that Sherry, that Sherry has said before. We're still shooting for a June 2019 final technical evaluation report. Um, I got my staff on a hard deadline to try to get out requests for additional information at the end of November so that we can have a December meeting on that in, in Richland. And um, then have a, that would put on the schedule a public meeting to talk about DOE's responses in March in Richland, Washington. So we're being as an independent regulatory agency, in this case we have no, we have no legislative responsibility, but we have, been we have been asked by the Department of Energy to perform the same role we perform at Savannah River and Idaho to evaluate their technical 
evaluations to support their waste termination. Thank you. All right, we have a few minutes for a few questions. So is there anyone who hasn't asked a question yet? Uh, and can you grab that microphone? Sorry, I should have grabbed it for you. Right around the corner there, one, two, three, four, fifth row, back, kind of orange. Yeah, what do you think? That makes it easy, thank you. Hi, um, so I'm just wondering the rationale over not removing the remaining 4% of the waste. So I, I think I'm taking this like way back, so sorry if this is kind of naive, but something, is it like the cost of completely removing and treating the waste versus like the cost of this? It seems like there's a lot of resources going into further modeling and leaving the waste um, and this like continuous um, monitoring and evaluation. So I'm just trying to understand the decision to just leave the waste when there seems like there's a lot of potential for it to leak or be contaminated later versus kind of treating it all now and dealing with it now. Yeah, um, Chris Kemp, who's gonna follow me, has pictures of like the waste residuals and in the tanks and some of the things of how we deal with them. So even at some tanks, they can be fairly thin layers that are hard to pick up. It's like trying to suction out the bottom of a glass, the last little little bit. But the in other places, they've had harder, harder problems because of the fact that the stuff has became sort of like asphalt and they're worried about damage to the tanks. But Chris um, will, uh, Kemp will get into that in his presentation. So keep your, keep your focus on that. And maybe we'll come back to that either after his presentation or when we get up to the, the uh, up here on the table. My mind and, does work. And I've, I've noted it as well. So we'll make sure that we get back to it. Did you have a, a follow-up that was uh, different than that or? Nope. Okay. I think, oh, right, you're right, yep, right down there and then we'll come over here. I'm coming in um, very green <laughs> to this and um, I had a question that relates to what this lady just asked. Could you get it a little further away from my face? Thank you. And, and let me just mention that Chris is kind of answering questions around what he presented. So if, if it is more on the technical, like it fits Sherry or Chris camp, then we may just defer it, but please go ahead. Okay, you may want to defer this. Um, it's my understanding that not all of those 16 tanks uh, has been, had the, material removed to the same level and just uh, is the assumption that it's going to be the averages or will it be um, you know if you're averaging out all of those tanks and if you're at 96 percent cleaned out now what if one of them is actually still 10 percent 12 percent will you just go ahead and leave the 12 percent because that's hard to get out in that tank um, what what thresholds are you examining in your um, analysis? And we use the tank by tank actual inventories to look at where the impacts are. Um, and also because of the different past behaviors at each of the tanks, basically what waste they put in there, what waste they transferred out over the years, how they mixed, all the different processes. Um, we have to look at the individual tanks because the tank may be right next to it, it'll have a di completely different history and a different inventory. So you can't just look at an average across the tanks. You have to make the determinations of what the risk is on a tank by tank basis. Um, like at Savannah River site, because of the design of the, and the way the layout of that tank farm was, they had one tank that mo had almost all the plutonium in it, uh, in the residuals. So if you were to average it out, it would have been a, quite a bit of difference. The problem was, the um, issue was that it was not only the most plutonium, but it was also the closest to the edge of the tank farm. So a lot of our effort went in looking exactly at how did that tank perform um, versus some more global issues on in, as a tank farm as a whole. But a lot of our recommendations in that final technical evaluation report were focused specifically on that tank and the plutonium in that tank. Did you have a follow-up question? Um, I think that takes care of it for now. Yeah. And when Chris gives his presentation, you may have other thoughts. So up, up here, up right over here, and then um, we're gonna move on to the next presentation. And again, only if there are more questions, 
chair. She looks right there. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask pretty much the same question I think that she asked. Uh, is, but in addition to that, um, adding on to that, is there, um, can there be alternative choices for different tanks depending on what they, what is found in those tanks and those tanks with more radionuclides that are uh, considered high level waste would be treated differently? Yeah, I mean, the determination is up to it. Well, one of the reasons we do it from tank, a tank farm basis is to try to already, in some ways, look at, is a neighboring tank going to affect the, the performance of another tank? But then you still have the individual tanks to look at. So you could have different decisions for different parts of the tank farm. Um, that may be how they put in grout. If they were still to go forward, how do they put in grout? Or do they want to go back and still recover more waste or do something else? But those could be done on a tank, tank by tank basis. Just because it's a tank farm look does not preclude a tank by tank basis, at least from our opinion. This is the, that would be the Department of Energy's determination. Okay, just, a just a follow up question. Uh, does that make any difference on how they will classify the waste in that tank, whether it's high level or low level nuclear waste, depending on what is found in each tank? That could, because of the, especially for the Department of Energy's DOE order 435.1, has one of its criteria is another gobbledygook from most people's point of view is the waste has to be class C or less. Low level waste is split into four classes of waste based on its long term long term hazard to intruders, with. A being the lowest, B the C, and then what's called greater than class C, which greater than class C is not usually approved for near surface disposal. So they have a determination of is it C, is it class C waste or is it greater than class C waste? Is a discriminator in the order's requirements. So if a single tank were to say that these other tanks all are C or less, but this tank is greater than class C concentrations, then that would not meet the criteria and therefore would have to be a different determination under the thing, that it would still have to be managed as high level waste. All right, thank you very much, Chris, and thank you for your questions. Again, I know there are more questions and we will definitely have uh, more opportunities. So those hands I was seeing over here, we will get to you. Um, so Chris, is coming up, Chris Kemp, uh, Office of River Protection, DOE. I think you're all set. Great. Again, uh, my name is Chris Kemp. I uh, work for DOE in Richland at the Office of River Protection. I'm going to put this down. And uh, I uh, have been involved deeply with the retrieval of the 16 tanks at Sea Farm. Um, we call them a tank farm, but it's also we're we're interchangeably using the word 16, uh, waste management area C or C tank farm. And I'll go through how we retrieve those tanks and uh, the period of time that we did it and the challenges we had and some of the successes and lessons learned as we go. So I'll give more of a field operational perspective of how we went through this uh, tank retrievals um, at C farm. Page up, page down, oops. So again, real briefly, um, Hanford site itself, um, we're talking about area in the center part of the Hanford site. Sea Tank Farm happens to be, and I'll hopefully, in the northeast corner of the uh, 200 East area. The waste treatment plant, which will vitrify tank waste, is located, it's, it's a little bit about a mile southeast, or yeah, southeast of the Sea Tank Farm. Sea Tank Farm was one of the four tank farms constructed in World War II. And uh, this gives a better shot of what those 200 East and 200 West areas um, looked like. <clears throat> we grouped our tanks for cleanup purposes and cleanup designation in the, um, the what we call the Tri-Party Agreement or Hanford Federal Facility Agreement and Consent Order into waste management areas. 
um, tank, single shell tank farm A and AX are a, a single waste management area. C farm happens to be its waste management area. And I know we're pressed for time. I will go through this later if somebody wants to, but I, I, I have Tom's and your question that I'll cover here in just a moment. This is an overview, colorized, so to speak, of this uh, tank farm. There are 12 530,000 gallon tanks and four 55,000 gallon tanks. And they are originally grouped in groups of three, tanks uh, C101 through 102 to 103. And all they simply did in 1946 when this tank farm went into uh, service is they kept filling up tank 101 and there was three cascade lines that would cascade waste, liquid waste, to 102. And to keep filling up 102, you keep pouring into 101, and eventually you pour in waste into 103. That ended in 1953 when these tanks were essentially retrieved at that time for unirradiated uranium, both to feed the, the uh, Cold War era reactors at Hanford, and in 1952 there were five reactors put into service at Savannah River. So. The biggest, easy, uh, the easiest source of uranium for all those reactors in that Cold War production era came out of tank farms at Hanford, and so these were sluiced. These tanks then were used almost literally in operational period in the 50s and 60s, almost like process vessels. So the point of that discussion is to say none of these tanks, as we retrieved them, were really alike. We call them sludge tanks, but I'll talk about that, uh, the difficulty of the material retrieving uh, and when we started in earnest on this in 2003 through 2017. Additionally, there's some uh, diversion boxes. These are basically pipelines uh, and junction boxes um, that fed these tanks um, and retrieved those tanks. Um, and then there's a low point in the farm, catch tank C301. All of this infrastructure is below grade. If you want to look at it, I'll show you a picture here in just a moment. Um, if you could see that during construction, the, the tanks themselves were uh, built with a carbon steel liner. I actually like to call that they were concrete tanks. I think that's a more accurate engineering term. They were concrete tanks with a carbon steel liner. As you can see, this was excavated out. When they finished the construction, you can see in this picture, they started back filling with soil. And there's about eight to 10 foot in sea farm of soil covering those tanks. So all this infrastructure is below grade. And I'll talk about this in just a moment. In this picture, you're seeing some pipeline pipes going into the t domes of the tank. That is our only access into those tanks. There are either four inch pipes, we call them risers, or 12 inch pipes, 12 inch risers, to be able to access into those tanks. This is what this tank farm looked like while we were uh, retrieving it. Um, the tank farms were taken, the single shell tank farms were taken out of service in 1980. In other words, they, they stored waste that we couldn't move to safer double shell tanks, but we were not using them to put in new waste after 1980. And so um, all the infrastructure, the water lines, the power for those farms were taken out of service. Um, and so to retrieve them, we had to bring in power, we had to bring in water lines, we had to bring in hose and hose uh, uh, lines that we uh, transferred waste over to AN-101 and AN-106 safer double shell tanks. It's always good for me to see a sketch of what these tanks look like, and again, there were um, 12 530,000 gallon tanks, and then there were four 55,000 gallon tanks. This C tank farm was not, there were, other, there were actually four tank farms constructed at Hanford during World War II, C, B, T farm, and U farm. They all had different operational histories once they came into service. All of these farms um, were constructed in 1944. This farm actually started service, as I said earlier, in 1946. 
all of our 100 series tanks, whether they're um, at, the, at the Hanford site, double shell, single shell tanks, if they're 100 series, meaning 530,000 gallon uh, capacity, 750,000 gallon capacity, 1 million or 1.2 million gallon capacity, they're all 75 foot diameter. The difference being the height of the tank itself. The Sea Farm 530,000 gallon tanks are 27 foot um, in height from the bottom up to what I call the haunch in the tank. We uh, uh, retrieved um, initially some what we called high heat sludge out of tank C-106 in 1998. And then I would say the retrieval mission at Sea Fang Tank Farm started in earnest in 2003. Um, finishing with tank C-105 in um, 2017. There was a number of technologies we utilized. Um, there is no off-the-shelf bring in a, a, a tank waste retrieval system that fits through a 12-inch or a 4-inch riser. So we had to work with fabricators across the country. We worked with fabricators um, recently, significantly in Sacramento. Um, we worked with fabricators in um, Richland, fabricators in Utah, uh, South Carolina. We even uh, worked with a fabricator in um, Wales for a vacuum retrieval system. Um, Sea Tank Farm was the first tank farm really retrieved in this recent era period. Again, post-operational, post-1980. Um, initially, we started sluicing, which um, means basically you're taking liquid and you're sluicing it in from the dome of the tank. And we found that we were somewhat successful with that. We realized we needed to get the energy down near where the waste was. And so we started using modified sluicing through enhanced reach sluicing systems. And we worked with a fabricator in uh, Sacramento, AGI, uh, to be able to develop this system. And we, we had some uh, many, many upgrades to that system, but, but that became the workhorse in our, our, our retrieval system. We had two tanks in particular that we used a mobile arm retrieval system. And again, you're up on the surface and you're going through a, um, either a riser or we had to cut a riser, cut a 54 inch hole in the case, uh, in the dome of the tank uh, for the mobile arm retrieval system. And that reaches down in to the waist and moves around that tank, almost as if I'm showing my arm right now. And they had pivoting systems at the, en at the end effector that moves just like what, I, what I'm doing with my hand right now. Primarily, they use sluicing at a, um, a little over 100 gallons per minute at 100 PSI, or if we had really hard material, and we encountered that material. We used 5,000 PSI water at uh, just at 10 gallons per minute. The idea is to mobilize material that's hardened down there and move it to the center of a tank and pump it out. Pump it the 40 foot up in a high in ele elevation and then pump it to the um, double shell tank system itself. Um, so some of the tanks that we had um, near the end we had very hard to retrieve material. And I got a graph at the end I talk about, most of it was aluminum mi mineral. The aluminum in those tanks came from the cladding of the reactor fuel. And so we had to use sodium hydroxide. Um, there's a picture here of a vacuum system. We uh, uh, cut the dome in. This is actually the tool to cut the dome in that we did at tank C-105, cut into the dome of the tank to be able to retrieve those um, systems. All of these retrievals were done either under um, the tri-party agreement or post October 25th, 2010 under the uh, a consent decree. And they used what we called, uh, we negotiated with the Washington State Department of Ecology and did the retrieval under a tank waste retrieval work plan. Um, it's a terrible acronym. Uh, it, people at work in the ecology call it a twerp. Um, it's terrible. But a tank waste retrieval work plan. Essentially, your RECRA authorization to retrieve those tanks. 
I'm going to show two pictures. Um, one is a tank uh, C-1010. The way we take these pictures after retrieval is um, we take a series of photos. It's actually 186 or 187 photos um, and we um, mosaic them together. So this is actually a round tank, believe it or not, but the way you do the mosaic, it makes it a little look squarish. But this is a tank and I have some, I have a graph at the end talking about how much um, was left in this tank. But you're seeing this was a, one of the very successful retrievals and there's some material, very thin film, um, there's some liquid that we end up um, evaporating it off after we've taken samples. We want to take those samples while there's still a little bit of liquid in there. If we get the liquid out, those solids that we have to sample after retrieval are extremely hard to get. So we leave a little bit of liquid in there um, that we can't pump out. Typically in these tanks, there'll be a, a, a heel, almost like you would have around a bathtub, around the edge. And sometimes there would be waste up on the stiffener rings. There were four stiffener rings in these tanks, providing uh, civil structure um, stability as those tanks were built. This is a different tank. This is a tank, C-102. This tank started with 318,000 gallons and it has this is about 20,000 gallons left. We actually deployed three technologies on this tank to retrieve it. Um, we were able to get down to the floor of the tank. We can see weld seams in there, but we have material in here that's gravel or material, particularly on this edge, that's as hard as um, asphalt. And we used a lot of energy, a high pressure water to break that up, and we simply couldn't. Then we did some caustic dissolution dig, and we were able to get almost 40,000 gallons of, of uh, solids out of that tank. But this is what uh, ended up uh, remaining after this retrieval method. Again, this was our most full tank, 318,000 gallons, 20,000 gallons left, so I wanted to give that context. I have a graph at the end going through each of the tanks. Oh my, five minutes. Okay, I will rush. Okay, I'm trying not to be disrespectful. I apologize. Um, we do, after we take the photo mosaic, um, we come up with a, uh, an ability to calculate the volume remaining in the tank and we create a computer aided design drawing of that tank. Our first tank that we retrieved, C106 and C103, we were um, so. I, where's Tom? Tom asked. There he is. Tom, what we try to do in those tanks is get nine samples in those tanks. But we learned, obviously, immediately, if we're underneath those risers and there's no waste, we had to create a tool that could go get that sample. And so we have an off-riser sampling system, a little tracked vehicle that goes down there. And what that does is, um, that goes through a 12 inch riser and, it, and the wheels expand out and we are able to drive around. But our goal always is to try to get nine samples. We haven't always been able to do that and we do this under um, authorization from the Washington State Department of Ecology and it's called a retrieval data report. So in our um, draft weir evaluation that we have on the website, if you want to go to section eight, starting on um, uh, section 8.2 has a series of retrieval data reports for each of the tanks we retrieved, so the 16 tanks. There were 16 retrieval data reports that were done. Um, what we sample for, obviously we sample for radionuclides. These are primary radionuclides. Um, there's inorganic metals, organics, pH, water content, bulk density, and what I don't have here. I talked about the aluminum earlier, the uh, mineralogy of those tanks. Um, Sherry has talked about um, retrieval, 96% of the waste, 96% of the key radionuclides. Um, this is also in the report um, table 4-7 and 4-8. So if you go to section 4 of the report, it talks about what we started retrieval and the volumes great, vary greatly. Um, C-102 was our most full tank. We end up with uh, 20,500 gallons left. 
Um, C-111, we started with 35,000 gallons, we ended up with 4,890. Well, C-111 was just about like asphalt, you know, on the entire um, um, depth of the tank, and we had to go through multiple caustic dissolution phases to get that aluminum material um, into a soluble form to be able to take that out. If we went to really aggressive methods, we would actually damage the tank. And so that's the bounding ability of what we're doing here when we retrieve those tanks. We don't want to damage the tank, but we want to do our best to get the material out. Through the period of 2002 through 2017, um, I've been asked what was the cost of all the retrievals, the technology development, the worldwide search that we did. Um, throughout the world, really, um, for technologies to be able to retrieve the tank. And some of the ones that were most applicable were getting sludges out of oil tankers, believe it or not. I didn't even know that was a problem with oil tankers. But we've, we've spent uh, just over $830 million over those years uh, retrieving those tanks. I did want to show, um, and I want to give credit to the next two slides to Jeff Burright. He works in the uh, Oregon Department of Energy, and he gave a great presentation on Tuesday down in Portland. And um, we talk about aluminum here. Can I? So, so we have remaining in the tanks residuals by mass. We have 74,000 kilograms of aluminum. We go through. Um, there's uh, sodium that came from the caustic that was used to uh, keep the pH of those tanks high. If you have an acidic environment, um, the carbon steel degrades quicker than if we have a caustic environment. Um, strontium-90, I'll talk about that in just a moment, um, is 115 kilograms of strontium-90. And then obviously we have a number of other radionuclides. So I'm just trying to be factual here. Uh, the 43% of the um, radionuclides that we've sampled out of those tanks is strontium-90. That has a half-life. In other words, half of that um, decays off. Yeah, and it's just over 29 years. It has a daughter product there, um, yttrium-90, and that's um, that has a half-life of uh, several days. Um, cesium-137, another main fission product that we deal with at Hanford. Um, the curies of that, it, it's just a tad over 30 years is a half-life. And then um, barium-137 has a half-life of just a few minutes. The point being is, a general rule, if you go to radiation protection, you get through 10 half-lives, you um, you essentially are at zero. Now, I don't want to bias this. One of the main things I worry about significantly is mobile contaminants. Technetium-99 is mobile just like water. Um, we have impacted groundwater in the operational period. We have one well um, that's 30 times the drinking water standard, um, very localized well, but we are going to have to pump and treat that. So I want to make sure that you get that information. Um, that's a, a contaminant that concerns me. That half-life is 211,000 years, okay? okay? I'm emphasizing, though, Sea Farm right now does not have a beneficial use. It's not being used for um, uh, drinking water or irrigation. Iodine-129, another particular, that has a half-life into the million of years, so I wanted to make sure I was balanced and factual in my discussion. And I feel like my facilitator stood up, so I better sh <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Well, I just know there are going to be lots of questions, so I wanted to give people a chance to ask you some questions alone and then in the panel as well. So I'm looking for hands. There were a bunch of them before Jerry. Jerry, uh, we get to him, and then we'll take the gentleman in the front. And again, to the extent you guys can leave with questions, um, and then presenters also uh, leave with answers. I'm Jerry Paulette, state representative from the 46th district, which is right here, welcome. And director of Heart of America Northwest, which has been working for the cleanup of Hanford since 1987. 
And my first question, and I think Sherry should get up there too to answer these, because I don't know if you've got the authority or she does, Chris. So well, we'll start with Chris. And then well, we'll Sherry first, we as a state legislator, I'm very disturbed that you did not invite the Washington State Department of Ecology to be a presenter tonight and to answer our questions, nor despite all the rhetoric of consultation with tribes, did you invite any tribal representatives to have a viewpoint tonight, or any citizen groups, obviously. Um, and I'd like to know why you did not invite the State Department of Ecology. This is not a public hearing. We're not given the opportunity to give oral comments tonight, despite the fact that the state of Washington, state of Oregon, tribes, the Hanford Advisory Board asked for public hearings. And I'll start there with that question of why the state hasn't um, been invited and point out kind of why that matters. And I think it's important to have Sherry up here because Sherry, for example, said, Plumes are not migrating off the site. That's just one of probably a dozen clearly factual, inaccurate statements made tonight. And no, I'm going to ask my question if you don't mind. I, I um, want you to ask the question rather than make a comment. Well, I'm going to make a comment. I'm sorry because you need perspective. Make a comment. And I'd like to know if you, the Department of Energy believes the plumes are not migrating off the site, what do you call the Columbia River with Contaminants including strontium-90 entering the river today at 1,000 times drinking water standard, right? Um, is the Columbia River not off the site? And okay, last, last question, Jerry. Um, the presentation said we can monitor and change things. You didn't have a slide tonight, unlike the state of Oregon's slides and a public interest presentation would have, showing the contamination levels in the sea farm, which have significant soil contamination. And I'd like to know if you have continued and do annual bor gamma borehole monitoring and will commit to doing that every year for the next 10,000 years to know if there is any further leakage from the tanks after you grout them. And how would you differentiate between the sa soil contamination that's there today and the new leakage which might be coming from migration from the bottom of a tank in 100, 500, or 1,000 years. OK, please. So there's a lot of questions. Help me out. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe go for the technical one at the well, end. And I'm sure. I'd like to know, sorry, please, first and please, foremost, please. I want to know why the State Department of Ecology wasn't invited to be a participant and have a say here, or the tribal representatives. Is that your question to answer? Well, the Washington State Department of Ecology was aware of this briefing. Oregon, deli um, Oregon um, wanted Department of Ecology to be part of the panel in Portland um, last two days ago in the evening. The intent here is not to exclude Washington State Department of Ecology. Our intent was to educate the public of what the draft weir evaluation is and get their um, and get our our, our our comment. Do you want to address the technical question about the monitoring? Okay. Um, the other one I want to um, say is Department or Hanford site does have contamination reaching the river, as I understand, at nano curious level. I do, am not aware of the number that was uh, presented, a um, thousand times the drinking water standard. So I don't know that answer. The but other is the monitoring report from last year. Okay. If, if, if the Department of Energy is going to say there is, quote, plumes are not migrating off the site. I, I corrected that. I corrected that, Representative. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. We do need to give time to other people. Thank you very much. Well, All right. Monitoring the and curing the contamination over the next 500 years, are you going to be monitoring 
for being from these tanks and somehow taking corrective action um, with, and are you even doing gamma borehole monitoring around that today? We are doing gamma borehole monitoring around Sea Farm. We're doing it in dry wells. And so for the audience, um, we are, have wells that are reach groundwater. Right now we're 274 foot uh, below the surface, but we have what we call dry wells. They're simply a well, they just don't go to groundwater. They're in the beta zone. You're pointing. I'm, no, I'm pointing just oh. where the next person. Okay, talking. keep no, talking. I'm no, sorry. But if you need to, fit, if you could wrap I'd up. I'd like to. Answer, I'm, please. I'm trying to answer as succinctly as I can. Then go okay. Ahead. And closure um, has not been approved by um, by the DOE, by the Washington State Department of Ecology. I don't want to speculate as to what the monitoring requirements would be, um, but it's. Okay, we're going to take two more uh, just because we spent some time on that. So we're going to take two more uh, for Chris, and then we're going to bring all the folks up. So, uh, so Sherry and, and other Chris, if you, Chris McKinney, if you guys could be ready to come up. So this gentleman in the hat, and then um, the, the purple shirt there, and then I think we'll move to the full panel and we'll get more questions. So, sir. Hi, uh, my name's Paul. I'm a, I'm a first timer. <laughs> um, the you mentioned tech 99 is one of your worries um it's my understanding that it's it's not just a radioactive properties but it's it has some chemical properties that have been surprises uh to the the technical people and do you have like an update on on their analysis of that so many of the radionuclides um, obviously have radioactive um, emission, but um, in particular like uranium is also a nephrologic uh, um, a kidney poison. Um, technetium-99, I'm not aware what all hazards it has, but I would not be surprised that there's a biological hazard to it beyond the uh, chemical. But that is analyzed in that RECRA um, analysis. We take not only radio emitter nuclides, we also address um, what, what can happen in, in the biota. Did you have a follow-up, sir? Um, well, just sort of a, I but, don't know, maybe but, I can't answer the question, but just a clarification of what I meant was that uh, I believe that attempts to separate Tech 99 out from solution has sometimes not brought the results that they expected um, because of its how it behaves chemically, not radio, not in terms of oh, radioactivity. In, in a remediation sense, uh, in a filtering sense. So there is a ability to do Tech 99. Um, groundwater pump and treat, but I'd encourage you to ask that question in a public comment. I don't know enough about that. I'm not trying to be evasive. Um, how effective it is, I think, is how I heard you. All right, thank you. We're getting the microphone over here, and then Sherry and, and um, Chris. Hi, my name is Judy, and I'm a first timer. As I understand it, you have to proceed to remove, DOE has the obligation to remove the waste in the tanks to the maximum extent practical. And I still don't understand, if you could just summarize briefly, why it is technically and economically impractical just to continue removing that 4% in the bottom of the tanks in the same way you remove the other 96%, which presumably would be to make it safe by transferring it to the double-sided tanks, as I understand it. Why is it not practical to just continue doing what you've been doing? So um, the, the consent decree in particular um, uh, describes is essentially, from a field operation standpoint, we run to um, a limit of technology and we run it for a number of shifts, and when we're essentially getting nothing out, at 0.6% volume, percent by volume, um, 
We work with the Washington State Department of Ecology, um, make the decision to stop. If one was to keep operating a system to retrieve, at some point you're going to damage that tank, that steel liner, and even the concrete, um, particularly with 5,000 psi water. That that that's very damaging if you kept running that system. So we we balance getting that material out to the best of our ability with our field equipment without damaging the tank. And we do that um, in consult with the Washington State Department of Ecology. Do you have a follow-up on that? No? Okay, thank you. So let's get all of our folks up here in the front. We'll turn the microphone on and I'll turn off the lights. For waste removal, are we on? You should be. Okay, so um, Chris addressed the technically practical side of waste removal. So we, we deploy a technology and we run it till it's basically just not getting any more out. And, and we've done multiple technologies in a tank. But from an economical practical standpoint, we look at the, not just the cost to deploy additional technology to remove more waste, but the cost in the terms of dose to the workers and the benefit, you know, what risk reduction can be made to determine whether it's practical to do any more. And so we, we've laid out that argument for technically practical and economically practical, the cost, um, dose to the workers, um, compared to the benefit, what risk reduction, what dose reduction could we uh, obtain to, to do more cleaning to determine that we've reached that practicality. Okay, thank you. I need my microphone runner back. Robin? <laughs> this gentleman over here with his hand up. Well, yeah, Robin, she's, I like her holding microphones. Thank you so much. Um, I am saying thank you so much because uh, it is uh, very unlikely that uh, I could be here. And uh, I am here. So my name is Ali, and I am from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And maybe the only Congolese who has the chance to ask this question as we are talking about Hanford. And my first question is, uh, I want to know, uh, as we talk about the tank C, so I am not very familiar because I, can have, I can't even have a chance to visit Hanfor as a Congolese citizen. But I want to ask, um, is, that, uh, is that the uranium from Congo that was used to, on uh, the tank C? Is that correct? Or? I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, the sea tank farm received waste from a number of different reactors, from a number of different sources. Um, uh, I don't know the answer to that. I am asking that question because uh, as you put it in uh, 46, uh, if uh, 1946, as it was built for the first uh, uh, type of reactor. And uh, <coughs> uh, as far as I am reading, I understood also there are different sources of uh, um, uranium coming from uh, uh, very many places, and uh, such of that of Canada, which was like zero. 0.2% and uh, from Congo, which was like 75%. Uh, and uh, I was reading a book that is uh, called Spies in Congos, which uh, when I, I read from uh, the voice of a 14 years old who said, like, um, she talked about the Chinkolobwe. 
And uh, my question is because I know you talk on how your expertise around the world as you collected your information. What uh, did you also try to look in uh, Chincolobe and uh, what kind of information do you have from there? I don't, we, we use a contractor. I'm not aware that we use um, expertise from there. Um, I, I, I can't, I, you know, I know that we, we do what's called request for proposals and look for contracts and we've used uh, equipment that came from India, we've used technologies from um, uh, uh, Europe and, um, and especially Russia in, in particular, but I can't, I don't know the answer to that. So, so that might be a good, if you have a question uh, that you could submit about that, if, if you have some information that could be helpful in the comment. So just one follow up. So maybe I'm not the right person to have information, but I will be. I am just a physician, and uh, what I am interested in uh, is uh, more about health impact. And when I see, uh, I, I try to understand what might be happening here. And when I try to look it at a global scale, because uh, uh, this is uh, maybe the ending point, but there is also uh, where it started when we have uh, uh, to start somewhere and I want to understand what happened along that chain and what is happening when we are trying to evaluate the health impact. Are we looking also at, uh, to what happened somewhere or what is happening till this day if there are health impact or radiation happening here. I am worried about that person who is uh, in the middle of that jungle of Congo who doesn't have a voice and doesn't have a protection. Just reflect. Thank, thank you very much. Okay. So I'm looking for other folks that have questions. Right, and I should know your name from Oregon. I'm so sorry you were at that meeting. I apologize. Julie, um, Julie, and then this gentleman here in the blue shirt will be next. Go ahead, Julie. Um, thank you for having this meeting. Thank you, panel. And thank you, audience, for being here to talk about these tanks that are on Yakima Nation, ancestral ceded lands. And my question is, um, it's really, it kind of starts at the beginning about why are you doing this? And what I heard was, why are you grouting the tanks? And I heard uh, to meet the criteria. And when I read the criteria, I see that it requires um, grout to be incorporated into the waste. And this is not incorporation. It's, it's an addition of grout to sit on top of waste that's too difficult to get out. So it's not really mixing, it's just going in there to fill the void space. And I think it's important to not, um, not use the word stabilize and incorporate the same because the criteria is incorporate. So my question is, um, with 161 tanks to go and a half a million curies in, this, in these tanks and 67,000 gallons of waste is 4% or something. So what, uh, when you go through a decision tree, what made you want to do a weir for just these tanks, not the contaminated soils beneath them or the groundwater, and, and just isolate the tanks for the weir with so much to go on on other retrievals? Because it's, you know, it's a budget decision too, so I just don't understand the decision point to do a weir. Sherry? Um, we've, this has been done at other sites and it is to address the risk associated. We, we are trying to, to clean up and reduce the risk and we think this is the right thing to do. Um, the soils is not part of this decision, but we are not ignoring the soils. You know, we, we've portrayed that soils and the groundwater are also um, issues that need to be addressed, um, and there will be public process on that as well. Follow-up question? Yes, thank you. Would you agree that putting a cap, filling tanks with grout, putting a cap over them precludes or makes really difficult and more expensive further exploration of the soils between the tanks, beneath the tanks, in the Beto zone, and in the groundwater? 
um, which is already a really difficult task. I appreciate the workers uh, out there doing this work, but a cap actually, uh, in order for it to serve its purpose, tells you not to do that. So I think it's like, you know, it's, yes. it's making one thing harder that doesn't make sense to me. It's a very good point. It's a very good question. Um, we are not intending to put the cap over the close. It will take us years to actually grout these tanks, get authorization, and actually grout them. The closure cap will be the final design is likely to be a rec or closure cap. So those soils decisions and groundwater decisions, they should all be made and when the final design of that closure cap is then made and put on place. Because you're correct, you would not want to penetrate through your closure cap if, you know, to do soil remediation. So, you know, we're not implying that the closure cap is gonna go on immediately. It's not, it's gonna follow those other decisions. Okay, thank you. So the gentleman in the blue shirt, then I'm gonna come over here to this gentleman uh, in the third row. Well, thank you very much. And I, I really wanna thank the gentleman from the Congo for bringing up the issue about where uranium comes from. Because Hanford has worldwide implications, not just about Hanford and Washington State. It's really how the use of these materials have damaged the world. So my question though is, I'm a toxicologist. My interest is in each one of these tanks, Aren't they their own hazardous waste site in a sense? You've got 16 hazardous waste sites, super fun sites in a sense, and you've got the dirt around the tanks with another waste site. You've got the dirt that's in the water that's coming off the bottom. Can you rank for me which are the most hazardous tanks based on their chemical and radiological material that's left behind? So I can look down the road and say, well, these are four or five tanks that are really hazardous. Here's one, you got most of the crud out of it, and it's not quite as hazardous, but I don't see how you can average things together and make any kind of decision on what the future steps would be. Who, who wants to take that? Is that a Chris? So I'm not trying to be evasive. I, I both the uh, uh, radiological hazard and the, the what we call dangerous hazardous dangerous waste, mixed low level waste, mix, mixed waste, mixed radioactive waste is what I meant to say. Um, the impact that is in remaining in the tanks per our uh, risk assessment is less than what went to the soil during the operational period. Um, Combined together, what our model is saying is that we're well below regulatory standards both for um, radiological constituents and, 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 the, and the chemical dangerous waste constituents. Assuming we address through groundwater pump and treat the Tech 99 right now that's in that one well, well, one well area. But I think your question to me is which of those tanks is the most hazardous? Mm -hmm. And um, we can go through the actual report, um, and, and it's pretty easy to do in section four. I just don't have it in my mind right now. I, I didn't. I mean, we, we look at the risk for the whole system, and we don't want to bifurcate something to get a uh, misrepresentation. But Chris, sec section four of the report does have a tank by yeah, tank. There's a number of tables in there that goes through the, I'm sorry. Okay, well, did you want to speak to yeah. that, Chris, well, I was specifically? Right, I was trying to clarify that that document only has a radiological, and of course the other report that's coming out that would actually save most hazardous from a mixed waste point of view would be the upcoming report that they have on the rec reclosure for inside tank um, that they're still working with the Department of Ecology on. And then, of course, there's a separate document that looks at the specifically at the risk of the soils from all, from all means because it is very similar to a surplus uh, cleanup of the soils and a rec, clean up, a rec road decision for the tanks themselves, as you stated. Um, so all those decisions have to be made before a closure cap or anything of saying what is actually going to be done to the tank farm. All three types of decisions have to be made 
it's just that right now we're only looking at we're talking about part of one of them but the other ones are currently being worked with department of culture did, did that address your question sir or do you know where to go for the answer? my follow-up is when <clears throat> i'm interested in trying to get a both an individual waste site and aggregate, because you, you're telling me you're dividing up radiological waste, chemical waste, and making a decision. Why aren't we making a decision of an aggregated nature about these <coughs> hazards? Because it is very hazardous material we're working with, radiologically and chemically. And you're telling me you're separating those out and making decisions? I don't like that. Well, this decision that we are discussing is the, the radiological component of the system, and it's limited to that. But I, we. And it's depicted on the graph back there, there will be a composite analysis um, that addresses all hazards and for, for both the, the system, the soils, and the groundwater. And that is, we have one out, um, uh, it was developed in 2000, and we are doing an, uh, an upgrade to that, and we will make that available. And that will be available before closure decisions are made. So you Yes. Yes. And the, the 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 current volume one that's the reference to this document it does identify by source terms in the tanks what's driving the risk. Uh, we just I don't remember that off the top of my head, but you can look and see which rads are predicted as causing the dose and maybe which tanks those are coming from. And we do have that information in the performance assessment. Remember again that if you have questions that don't get answered tonight, comments uh, our questions make great comments, so you can submit those as well, as well as just comments you have based on the information you have tonight and otherwise. Uh, sir. Well, I was just wondering um, if anyone's done like a pie in the sky analysis, what could you do if there wasn't any restriction on resources in terms of money and it was only just technology? Um, you know, you, you commented you've got hundreds of millions of dollars in this, but, you know, to the Defense Department, that's trivial. Uh, and they're the ones that made the mess in the first place. So I'm just wondering, you know, what, what's the pie in the sky picture? We do not know how to get more waste out and do not believe it's, in, it's beneficial from a risk perspective to take even more waste out. As far as a published analysis also in um, 2013, um, a tank, hampered tank closure and waste management EIS analyzed a no action alternative. Um, that was part of your question. Um, but as far as getting more material out of the tanks without damaging those tanks. Um, I mean, we, we would have to cut into the dome of the tank. I'm, I, well, what if you could just remove the tank entirely? If you remove the seat tank farm, we've done a study under a TPA milestone, you removed all the tanks. You get 38% of the radionuclide that's been released from the operational period. That's not clean closure. There is material that washed beyond the tanks with all the active water lines and pipelines that have all since been cut off. Um, yes, you can dig up the tanks, and the risk reduction is, is um, published in the Tank Closure and Waste Management EIS. All right, so I'm looking for one more person that hasn't asked a question tonight before we go. Let's go to this gentleman in the bright blue shirt there, and he will get the last question, I think, tonight. I'm not sure you can answer this question, but you should think about it when you're making your decision. And that is, what kind of institution do you plan to leave in place which will monitor, assess, and possibly take action on these for 10,000 years? Thoughts on that? Yeah. Question or a comment? That's a great question. And actually, when we built the low-level waste regulations at, uh, for NRC, of course, the time period we did this was the early 80s. And for those of us who are old enough, there was an important thing in New, in New York that reminded us of, of institutional memory and problems um, called Love Canal. Uh, 
one of the situations in Part 61, or sorry, the Lola Voice regulations, I don't want to use acronyms or godly regulations, um, is that we don't allow anyone to take any credit for more than 100 years of control. That you can't assume active maintenance, you can't assume that you're going to be able to keep people off the site, you can't assume anything. You can all intend to, and we hope that everybody intends to maintain control as long as possible. But we don't let the assessments take those, assess those, those, those things into account. So that when you build something or you want to leave something behind, you have to analyze as if the only things that you're going to be able to do is the passive controls that you can build into the system, either chemically or some physical characteristics. That's why we want to see, when we asked, and we asked many times at the, at the scoping meetings, what could be possible damages to the cover? What could happen after an earthquake? What could happen for a flooding event? All of these what ifs over the years, because you are not going to be able to, well, it's not from a, for protecting future generations and from us doing an activity, we can't put on them saying that they will maintain the active controls to make it safe. We've got to make a decision today on something that we think is going to be safe, even if they don't do anything. And uh, so we've tried to s break that into the thing of for the risk assessment and long-term evaluation that you try to take that into account. Sir, did you have a follow-up? <laughs> In another 10,000 years, I will. <laughs> All right, we'll, uh, we'll make a note and we'll come back to you. <clears throat> there were three questions that I noted that I think you you touched on. Um, one was, why would you make a decision to leave 4% in the tanks? Uh, there was a question about all 16 tanks having material removed to the same amount. I think you spoke to that a little bit and pointed to table four. And then I had a question around um, if there might be different choices for different tanks. And I think you, you spoke to that. Um, at least I think you did. I think I heard something about that. But if that was your question and you didn't get it answered, uh, please ask it as you submit your comments and uh, and let them know that you're concerned about that and you would like to see that addressed in the analysis if, if that's something you have. So thank you very much for coming this evening. Again, November 7th is the closing for the comments. Uh, Sherry, did you have anything that you wanted to add by way of conclusion? All right, thank you, thank panelists. You. Yeah, from us, thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. All right.